This video contains the numerical answers to the Higher Physics Our Dynamic Universe Revision Test. Now if you've not seen that yet, then go to the website physics-podcast.co.uk and of course the link will be up in the top right of this video right now. Click Test Area and you'll find this. So there are 10 multiple choice questions. Now I would suggest that you get a piece of paper or a jotter and actually make sure that you're, you're writing down all the work into the questions once you've selected your answers, down at the very bottom of this test, after question number 10, you'll find a, a button which says Submit. If you click that, then of course if there are any questions which you've answered wrongly, you'll then be directed back. A link will be shown to the video and I'll go over the answer to that question. OK, this is the answer to question number one. And it shows us the voltage of 5 plus or minus 0 0.1 volts one thing to say is that of course the uncertainty is written with the same unit as the reading itself of voltage so when we've got that it's obviously it's not a percentage uncertainty this is what's known as an absolute uncertainty so we've got voltage 5 plus or minus 0 0.1 and current 0 0.25 plus or minus 0 0.05 amps and in order to work out the percentage uncertainty we just take the absolute uncertainty Divide it by the reading, so 0.1 divided by 5, multiplied by 100, gives us 2% for the voltage. Current, of course, the absolute uncertainty of 0 0.05, divided by a reading, 0.25, as we have here. Multiplied by 100 gives us 20%. And, of course, the resistance, that will be calculated from voltage over current, R is V over I. And, of course, the current, because the uncertainty is a larger value, 20%, that would then contribute the greatest uncertainty in resistance. So we actually take the percentage uncertainty in resistance as being the largest of these values, which is of course 20%. For the second question, I'm actually going to show you three ways to work this out. This is the first, S is equal to half times U plus V multiplied by T. So of course we've got 0.5 times a value of initial velocity is zero final 26.8 and a time of 10.9 and of course that then gives us this value here 146 meters second method we could use is to work out the acceleration first from a is equal to v minus u over t same values of course gives us the acceleration of 2.46 ms to the minus 2 and then of course use this value of acceleration in our equation s is ut plus half a t squared a second equation of motion that of course gives us exactly the same value no surprise there 146 meters of course just remember to square the value of t or time of 10.9 seconds otherwise obviously we'll get the wrong value if i show you the last method just by moving this up it's another equation of motion v squared is u squared plus 2as and the first thing of course is that i would actually work at the acceleration the same way it was done in the last question which is here using a is v minus u over t 2.46 so i would do that first and then use that value of acceleration in our v squared is u squared plus 2as equation and everything after this is basically just rearranging the equation as i said before if i'm going through this a little bit quickly then just pause the video and have a look through the answer but again that will give us a value of distance as 146 meters so you can actually see i'm using one two three all four of the equations of motion and of course any of these methods would be appropriate right what i've got here is a diagram of the question okay what i've got here is the diagram shown in the question of the block on the slope and this is the pulling force of course up the slope and it does say in the question that of course the block is moving up the slope and if it's moving up the slope friction is always in the opposite direction so we have a friction force acting down the slope and acting parallel to the slope itself we also of course we have the weight acting straight down as it does and one component of that weight force is this one here which is parallel to the slope and i've just called that f parallel so the component of the weight force parallel to the slope can actually be worked out from mg sine theta the other thing of course is that the the block is being pulled up the slope at constant speed 
And of course, if any time you see constant speed, you're thinking of balanced forces. So it must be that the total force up the slope is equal in magnitude to the total force down the slope. So what I'm going to do is to add the friction force plus this F parallel, the component of the weight down the slope. This is this mg sine theta. Add these two together. And of course, in magnitude, or in size, of course, the pulling force must be equal to the sum of these two. Now, if I move this up, you can see that, as it says in the question, the friction force is 7 newtons. And working at this component of the weight down the slope, mg sine theta, I've got the mass of 5 multiplied by g on Earth is 9.8 times the sine of the angle 30. Of course, make sure that your calculator is in degrees and not radians. And that gives me 24.5. So, of course, it must be that this pulling force is equal to 7 newtons plus 24.5, which gives me, if I move this up, a pulling force of 31.5. For question number four, we're actually told this force here, 21.2 newtons. And, of course, that's the force that the newton balance itself is exerting on this 2 kilograms mass. So the force pulling it upwards. The other force, of course, that we have acting on this mass is its weight. And, of course, that would be downwards. And we'd be using the equation W is equal to M times G. Its mass of 2 multiplied by gravitational field strength on Earth, 9.8, gives us a force of 19.6 newtons. So, as I said, the newton balance is exerting this upwards force of 21.2 newtons. And we have the weight force downwards. So, in order to work at the acceleration of the object itself, all we need to do is use this equation here from Newton's second law. A is F over M, where F is the unbalanced force. I'm also applying what's known as sine convention. So I'm taking any force acting upwards as positive. That means, of course, that we've got plus 21.2. This force I take as negative, 19.6. So when I add these two forces, I've got 21.2 plus the downwards force, which is the weight, negative 19.6 divided by the mass, and that gives me an acceleration of 0 0.8 ms to the minus 2. Now, that would mean that the lift could be accelerating upwards at 0 0.8 ms to the minus 2. I'm not going to explain it in too much detail. It could also be decelerating downwards. And, of course, if it's moving downwards and we have an up or an unbalanced force in the upwards direction, that would also cause it to decelerate. So as I said, it could be accelerating upwards with this acceleration here, 0 0.8 ms to the minus 2, or could actually be decelerating downwards. Question number 5 is an impulse question. And this is the equation that we usually use with impulse questions. Impulse is, of course, the change in momentum. And this is the final value of momentum minus the initial value of momentum. Or it can also be equal to the average force exerted on the object multiplied by time. Rearranging this equation, obviously just dividing both sides by t, gives us this, that the force exerted in the object is change in momentum, mv minus mu over t. What I've done here as well is I've taken the 15 grams and I've converted that to kilograms. So 15 grams is just 15 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, multiplied by our value of v, 2.4. And of course, since initial velocity is zero, then initial momentum mu is zero, divided by the time, and that gives us this force here, 7.2 newtons. Now, I could have worked that out a different way, working at the acceleration of the object first. A is V minus U over T, gives us this, 480 ms to the minus 2, and then plug this value of acceleration into Newton's second law, F is equal to ma. Now, I've actually worked at the mass a slightly different way. Of course, I've taken the value of 15, which is the mass in grams, divided by 1,000 in order to get that into kilograms, and then, of course, multiply that by acceleration. No surprise, of course, that we get the same value of force, 7.2 newtons. For question number six, this is the equation we're using. F is equal to capital G times M1, M2 over R squared. Now, of course, this value of G, that would be found in the data sheets. And 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11, that's its value. The two masses, of course, they don't need to be in this order. We could have had mass 1 as this mass here, the mass of the Earth. Mass 2 could have been 
the mass of the satellite, but I've, I've just called the mass of the satellite M1, mass of the Earth M2, divided by this distance. And of course, that distance is from the satellite to the center of the Earth. Sometimes you'll actually be told the radius of the planet and also the distance from the surface of the planet to the satellite or some other object. And of course, we would have to add those two together. Not in this question. Other thing is as well, just remember to square that and to write this squared in the equation, and we should end up with a force of 93.9 newtons. This is the answer to question number seven, and we're using this equation here, and of course we're told that an alien on board the spaceship measures its length to be 76.0 meters. That would actually be this value here, L, because of course the alien is on board the spaceship, they're using some kind of measuring device in order to measure its length. Obviously, they're in the same inertial reference frame as the spaceship. They're measuring what's known as the proper length. Anyone else, and we're talking about the person, the observer on Earth, would then measure a, a shorter, a contracted length, and that's L dashed. So L dashed is the contracted length, and that's measured by someone in a different inertial reference frame. L is the proper length measured by someone in the same inertial reference frame. So that's the most important thing with this equation, that we don't mix up L dashed and L. So proper length is 76. Apart from that, we're actually told that the velocity is 0.6 C. So that's our value of V divided by C. Sometimes you'll actually be told the velocity in meters per second, and then, of course, you would substitute that for V in here, and you substitute the actual speed of light, 3 times 10 to the power of 8, into here for C but we're actually told the ratio of V over C is 0 0.6. Of course, remember to square it, and remember to square root 1 minus V over C squared, but it should give us 60.8 metres. And the important thing, of course, before answering this question is you should have in the back of your mind the fact that you would be calculating a shorter distance. This is the answer to question number 8, and we're using this equation here and trying to find the observed frequency. And, of course, FS, that's the frequency of the source, 850 hertz. V is, of course, the speed of sound, 340 meters a second, which would be found in the data sheets. And VS is, of course, the velocity of the source, 20 meters per second. Importantly, this equation can, of course, have the plus sign down in the bottom row here. We're using the, well, we're subtracting V minus VS. And the reason is, of course, we need to know that when the object is approaching, then the observer hears a higher frequency. The actual answer works out as 903 hertz, where the frequency of the source is 850. So when it's approaching the observer, they hear a higher frequency. So we need to know that before we answer the question. And of course, the fact that this is using the negative sign will give us a smaller number in the bottom row here, meaning, of course, that the observed frequency is greater than the frequency of the source. If the source, which in this case is an ambulance, is moving away from the observer, then they would then hear a lower frequency, a lower frequency than 850. So in our equation, we would actually use the plus sign in this bottom row here. And that would, of course, mean that FO, the observed frequency, would then be lower than the frequency of our source. So there you go. In this question, minus sign here, and our final answer, 903 hertz.